neither was guile found in his mouth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Words, dear brethren, from today's epistle. And today we continue on with our series on the Ten Commandments for, for the sermon. Really, we finish up the Ten Commandments because today we deal with the Eighth Commandment, uh, as you may remember that we did the Sixth and the Ninth together and the Seventh and the Tenth together, so that just kind of leaves the Eighth. Um, the Eighth Commandment today we finish up with, which is, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So, with the Eighth Commandment, as with all of the commandments, there's always that positive and negative aspect to the commandments. The positive aspect to the Eighth Commandment is that people have a right to truth. That when somebody speaks, we have a right as as human beings to hear that and recognize their words to be true, to have that basic trust that we're not being misled or mis, uh, or being lied to, essentially. And to be truthful is to be godly, because in as our Lord says, he, s- he tells us that I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's being truth itself. God can never deceive us. God can never lead us astray, and he would never lie to us. And for us, in our lives, being honest, being truthful, is really to be on that side along with God, to value the truth uh, as high as it should be, as something that is part of the divine essence. St. Thomas Aquinas talks of the, 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 the essential nature of truth in the heart of every human being, um, regarding especially with that of Christians, to act virtuously. Then he says, it's so necessary and it's so important that a man could not, uh, in order to save the world, he could not tell one lie, because in and of itself, lying is inherently evil. So, what makes this, what is the, that, let's delve into that Eighth Commandment a little more to understand it better. The negative aspect is that, uh, is broken down into several parts as to different ways in which we violate the Eighth Commandment. One way that we can see for the, how the Eighth Commandment is ingrained on the hearts of all men. As we know, all the Ten Commandments are. Everybody, we talked about at the very beginning, how it is part of the natural law, that every man knows that these commandments are part of the truth of God. Well, even those who have no religion whatsoever will know that being lied to is something that offends them, that they feel betrayed by by that misgiving. And so that leads us to the first aspect of how, in the negative side of of the commandment, we violate it. Lying. Lying is something that is a statement we think or know to be untrue. And lying is something that is always sinful, no matter what. So, like we said, as St. Thomas told us, you can't even save the world by telling a single lie, because... To do so, you can't do evil just for the procurement of good. It's still evil in and of itself. Um, However, usually, in most cases, a lie is a venial sin. Why? Because the nature of it only has a slight bit of damage that it does. It's only when the matter in which someone lies, or the maliciousness that is there, is truly grave. So, you know, generally speaking, if... If a child is asked if they made their bed this morning, and they say yes, and they hadn't done so, they commit a slight fault. They commit a venial sin. But if someone were to be asked um, you know, by a priest if they had followed through with the advice given in spiritual direction, and they lie to the, to the priest... There's a, a larger level of, of gravity to that because they're doing more harm to their soul. The, 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 the priest has, you know, is trying to counsel and trying to give good advice 
to help with somebody and they're out of, you know, out of, uh, for whatever reason of they're, they're not telling him the truth. There's a little bit more gravity to that. And if someone lies in the confessional, then there is a, a grave gravity to that for sure that also commits sacrilege. So, so as gravity increases, so does the level of sin. And if it is grave enough, it is a, if it is an important enough uh, matter, then it can become a mortal sin. <clears throat> we also see not just lying as a violation of this commandment, but also calumny. So what is calumny? Calumny is a lie that is told to specifically take away the good name or to harm of the good name of a person. So if I lie about whether or not I had done a task, that is just a, a straightforward lie that does, you know, does nothing against another human being. But if I lie about somebody to make them look bad, to take away from their name, I tell, I say to another person that, oh, you know, John Smith, he, um, you know, he is oftentimes a drunkard, and that has no basis in, in reality. I just do it to make them look bad. That's called calumny, and calumny, more often than not is almost always mortally sinful because of the fact of that malice that is involved. I'm lying for the very purpose of taking away a person's good name. Detraction is connected to calumny, but the difference between detraction and calumny is that detraction is actually a true statement, but it is a statement for that same purpose of taking away the good name of another individual, to harming the way other people see that person, um, and to do so is also sinful. Um, just because it's true doesn't mean I should say it. Just because it's true doesn't mean someone has a right to hear it. A person, this is where, with those two sins, calumny and detraction, you may remember, they overlap a bit with the seventh commandment. It's been you know a little while since we, we, we were at that commandment, but they do overlap because a person has a right to a good name. They possess it like a possession, like owning a car or or owning a pen, whatever it may be. Any kind of physical object that they physically own as their as their own is the same in that regard to their good name. A person has possession and a right to possess his good name. And it can only, you know, and we cannot take away from that unnecessarily. We'll get to where necessity comes in shortly in a little bit. And it's important to, to recognize with those sins that, that need of restitution and the difficulty of that restitution towards good name. Um, St. Philip Neri, the often told and often known story of St. Philip Neri, the woman and the pillow. She, you know, she was often given over to gossip, taking, you know, speaking loosely and giving and detracting from people's good name uh, in her own life. And so one day, St. Philip Neri, upon hearing her confession, gave her a penance and said, go to the top of the bell tower and bring with you a pillow and wait for me there. And she, so she did. She went up to the top of the bell tower and he said, now tear open the pillow and scatter the feathers through the wind. And so she did so, and the feather, feathers fluttered around and everything. And now he said, now go and collect every single one of them and bring them back. And she said, well, I can't do that. That's impossible. They're scattered so far and wide. How can I know that I got every single one of them? And he said, well, it's the same when it comes to detraction and calumny to the damage done to other individuals. You can never truly make it right again. You can never truly take it completely back again, um, no matter how hard you try. And so that's why we have to be so careful um, regarding the good name of others and having loose lips towards the, their faults and failings uh, that we don't, once we've said it, we can't unsay it. Another violation of the Eighth Commandment is backbiting. Backbiting unnecessarily is, ta is talking unnecessarily of another's known faults, uh, which is the difference between that and calumny uh, and detraction. 
I'm detracting from somebody, the other person whom I'm speaking to doesn't know about some sort of fault or sin uh, of that person. But if I'm backbiting, then the other person already knows those faults. They already know that, you know, perhaps so-and-so has a problem with the drink or so-and-so might have a problem towards anger. But I'm just talking about it for the sake of talking. And it's still sinful. This type of petty gossip is still a sin. And oftentimes one that is so easily overlooked. Because it's still harmful to the name of that person. Even if people already know about it, I'm, I'm refueling the fire, if you will. I'm bringing back up faults that are there and that people know about. But I don't need to. And I'm, you know, I'm reminding people of them unnecessarily. I'm also acting in a way that is contrary to charity. I have no need to do so. No good is coming out of my words. And so therefore I violate charity and I sin by my gossip and my backbiting. Hypocrisy is another violation of the Eighth Commandment. Why? What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy, oftentimes we think of it, it could be multiple ways. One is that we speak in a way that is that makes ourselves look in a, in a higher level than we are. So I may say good things, but then I do the opposite. Or I may do even good things when certain people are around, but in reality, outside of certain company, I do this. I act in a different way. It is a speaking or an acting to make ourselves look better than we are. Now, I don't mean trying to put our best foot forward in front of people. That is, that is different. But when it is a dishonest representation of ourselves, then that is hypocrisy. I'm presenting a different person than I actually am. And by doing so, I'm misleading. I'm being dishonest with the people who I, whom I, I speak about, uh, to, or, to or about. Another violation of the Eighth Commandment is rash judgment. Rash judgment is when we attribute blame or sin without sufficient reason or evidence in doing so. That, that is, whether it's in my own mind or it's in things that I say, I've attributed sin, uh, uh, guilt, to someone that I don't have enough information to do so. There was a story one time of a man who was a jeweler. And, you know, he was a fair man, but he was a little quick in judgment of other people. And so he had a servant, a servant that had been with him for a number of years. And um, he, all of a sudden, after a while he started noticing little trinkets missing from his store. And he didn't put too, too much thought into that. But one day, something valuable, one of the jewels was taken, it disappeared, and he couldn't find it anywhere. Well, knowing that his servant was the only one that had access to the store, he immediately, without questioning him in any kind of way, accused him before the courts of stealing from his store. And the man was arrested and Convicted because the people in the, in the community knew the, the jeweler not to be necessarily a liar. And the man was convicted and, and sentenced to death for, for his theft from the jeweler. But it was after the fact that he realized one, one day that uh, a magpie bird had flown into the window and he saw it make off with a ring that was on the table. And so he followed the magpie to where it landed and saw a nest. And in the nest, he saw all the little trinkets and jewels that had been taken by the bird. And from that point on, he he immediately um, confessed uh, his rash judgment of the servant. And for the rest of his life, had masses said for the repose of that servant's soul to make, uh, you know, to the best of his ability, amends for, for the wrong that he had done. But one simple questioning, one simple asking of that, and trusting in the word of someone who had been faithful to him for so long could have prevented all of that hardship and, and wrongdoing there had he just simply trusted the servant and asked him 
after his years of service. But no, he was rash in his judgment, and he didn't think the possibility that there could be another explanation. So rash judgment, we attribute blame or sin to somebody without having sufficient evidence to do so. And that, uh, and we, we entertain that. That's a, a, a sinful against the Eighth Amendment. Perjury. Perjury is lying under oath. And this is a damaging sin to society as a whole. And, excuse me, and the reason that it's separate from just lying in itself is because it is more damaging and it typically has the nature of a mortal sin. And the reason for that is that it calls God, truth, its, truth himself, down as a witness to a lie. To knowingly lie under oath is usually almost always mortally sinful because we're calling God to witness our our uh, our lies. And uh, this is this once again we talk of overlapping with other other commandments. This overlaps with the second commandment, as you may or may not remember. But it, uh, perjury is its own violation against the eighth commandment because it is a lie under oath. Now we talk of. <clears throat> All the, the ways that we violate the Eighth Commandment in regards to uh, telling things that are not true <coughs> or, uh, or having rash in judgment towards other people, fault-finding in these ways. But it's also necessary to show that while we have to be truthful, while we have to be honest, not every truth has a need to be said. Not every truth has a need to be revealed. That's, and it is in that that we realize that we're not being dishonest if we're not, I should say, we're not lying if we don't reveal everything that is said. For instance, a secret. It is perfectly legitimate to keep a secret when necessary or for any kind of good reason. And if someone trusts us in confidence with secrets, then... It is our duty to maintain that secrecy unless there is a truly justifying reason, which we should always be careful about, but if there's a truly justifying reason to reveal someone's secret. You know, almost always, for anybody who confides in us uh, with something that is secret, almost always, we should maintain that secrecy. It's only when someone else has a need and a true right to know that information that we're not bound to maintain that secret. So what do I mean by that? So, for instance, if someone is plotting uh, some sort of crime and they tell me about their crime and they tell me, oh, you know, keep it a secret, I have no need to keep that as a secret because... Uh, because the proprietor of whatever, say, bank that they're going to rob or store they're going to rob has a right to know that someone is planning to rob their store. And so I, and therefore, I'm no longer bound to keep that as a secret. But, or, um, but if somebody confides in me something that may be damaging to their good name, but tells me in confidence, just because I think, well, you know, they, they've told me this and, you know, maybe it might be helpful if somebody else knows to try to help them out or something like that. No, I cannot violate that secret just because I think there might be something I, good I can do from that. I've been told in confidence, I have to maintain that confidence um, because the, even though it might, I might be able to gain some help from somebody, I am not at liberty to speak about it, and that person, who, whomever they may be, doesn't have a need to know what has been revealed to me. It also goes along with it that we have to always be very careful as to what consti constitutes justifying reason for revealing a fault of another. We said, this is, we come back to that whole detraction aspect of the Eighth Commandment, that, you know, unless we have a justified reason for revealing the fault of another, we can never do so. Yet, it's too often that we are very quick to justify why 
we speak against somebody's good name, that you know, we will say to ourselves, oh, I, I, have to, I have to vent a little bit. It's bothering me so much, I have to sell somebody so I can calm myself down. Or it's bothering me so much, I have to get some sort of advice from Joe Schmo or you know, <coughs> some sort of sibling or something like that. Or, you know, what, whatever reasons come to our mind, we can very quickly and easily justify speaking of another's fault. Yet, in reality, we're misleading ourselves, or, and we're still detracting from another person without that true need. If I have a real need for it, then I will seek somebody that really should know in order to get really solid advice from somebody and try to present the, the situation with as much charity in the way I speak of it as possible. Always searching for somebody who either has you know training in that aspect of advice, something somebody like a priest, or somebody who I know is wise, prudent, and most of all, discreet that could assist me in advice and need it. But making sure that I truly have a need to do so. Um, going along with that aspect is also the recognition that by revealing somebody's faults unnecessarily, not only do I detract, but I can also scandalize in that way. If, if people look at some uh, at another person as a good Catholic, say, and I know that they have some sort of fault, and I, and I say it, not only have I detracted, but I may have scandalized another person with that. Oftentimes, uh, parents can have to be really careful of that because they will vent about their spouse to their children, and that is scandalous. You've, you, you've caused scandal in the minds and hearts of children by doing so because it is a parent's duty to always present their spouse in the greatest light possible in the eyes of their children in order that they maintain that proper respect and hierarchy there. So we have to be careful um, in regards to scandal that can come from violating the, the, that, uh, the, from committing detraction. Now, there are a couple areas in which people oftentimes have questions about regarding truth and, and how it can be promoted uh, and, you know, and lies, if you will. Jocose lies, as we call them, a lie that is a joke. Is that something that is sinful? It can be, but not always. So a jocose lie, a joking lie, is not sinful if everybody is in on the joke. If everybody knows that it is only out of jest, that it is only in good fun, and there's no, there should be no credence put into such talk, then it's, then it's not wrong. There's no sin involved. There's no actual misleading of another person. You could even extend that to if the, the if you did it out of fun that is not harmful to somebody and they might not have known at that instant that it was a joke, but you soon thereafter let them in on the joke. Then once again, no real harm has come. You've just you have presented something in good fun. But if we maintain that and our joke is to laugh at somebody because they don't understand, they don't get it then we still have lied. And therefore, it can be sinful in those times when, when we have lied, presented a lie to an individual with the intention of maintaining, uh, with keeping them in the dark as to realizing that they ha are not receiving the truth. We, even though it, no real true harm comes from that, we still are misleading somebody and we violate the importance, the inherent importance and necessity of truth. Same goes for white lies. White lies are those little lies that are told in order to not offend somebody. We think we're doing well by telling little white lies so we keep somebody else's feelings intact, if you will. But if it's truly a lie, it's still truly wrong, even though it's small in nature. And of course, it has very light matter in the terms of sinfulness. But it's still a lie, and we can't do so. Uh, and so therefore, we have to always be careful of that, that aspect of white lies, because many times people mistakenly think that they're not sins, when they actually are. It does not mean, however, that 
once again, we have to reveal all the information and all of our thoughts towards uh, something in order to, uh, that might hurt somebody's feelings. We can withhold some information in order to maintain that, um, that aspect of, of respect and, and cordiality towards another one, another person. So if someone serves us a dinner, for instance, and they, and they ask us how was the dinner, and we didn't care for the way it tasted because perhaps we don't like whatever the food item was. I can say it was good because perhaps it was good, you know, it was a good, uh, you know, vegetable casserole of some sort, but I don't care for that, um, but it was prepared well. They don't, you know, I'm not lying to them because it was well done, but it was something that, I don't have to tell them I didn't like necessarily this. Um, and so I, we don't want to use that type of what we call mezzo reservation very loosely, but at times we can get away with not revealing everything. So we maintain that good, uh, the, those good, if you will, feel, maintain feelings of another to, to, to not be offensive to another. In all things regarding the Eighth Commandment, we have to always come back to that aspect of truth. Truth is of the utmost importance. Truth is why we are here today, because we know that the Catholic faith is the true religion. We've followed that truth to move ourselves out of the Novus Ordo Church, because what they present to us is essentially a lie. It is contrary to what we know Christ has taught us. And because Christ never lies, because God never misleads, we know by our actions in our life that we should always follow after him. And thus, we should always be truthful. We should always avoid misleading other people. And we should always love the truth as we love Christ himself. And if we do so, then we will follow in his footsteps by our life. He was honest even when it was difficult, even when it meant he would die a most painful death. For us, we embrace that virtue as we embrace the very essence of God himself and harbor it in our hearts at all times. And if we do so, and then we'll always find ourselves siding on the side of God, that is, the side of truth forever.